Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You know, the paradox of being a Christian, the joy of the Lord overflowing, there are those other times where we walk through valleys, where we walk through darkness, where we walk through struggles of life. But as Jesus teaches us that through trials of life and through tragedies even, there is reward on the other side. Just as we look at the cross, you would think that, boy, that's tragic and that's devastation and it was over and there's no tomorrow. But hallelujah, tomorrow came. And if for us too, the same way, as we look to our Savior, tomorrow comes. So whatever you might be going through today, there may be some valley, there may be some darkness. Remember, tomorrow comes. And if you're a Christian, that is the hope of glory, Christ residing in you. See, Jesus himself, he, he said that the cross before him, he was able to endure it because of that joy that was set before him. And praise God, that joy is for each one who believes in the Lord Jesus. And uh, these are the days where things in the world are coming against the church in the sense of what we believe. Uh, even the pastors of many mega churches are being uh, pressured to push and preach on feelings and things of that nature, surface messages, instead of the message of the cross. See, the message of the cross is the power of salvation for those who believe. If you look in the book of Corinthians, which we're going to be taking our text from, it said this. It says that the cross was foolishness to those who were perishing. You see that? Foolishness. But to those, it, it is the power of God for those who are being saved and have been saved. Because there's no other way for salvation except through that cross. Amen. And we said, well, that's a relic. It's antique. You know, was that an afterthought? on God, that, that, that cross, and he would just make something good out of bad? No, before the creation of the world, Christ was crucified. It was the ethics, efficacious will of God, God's determined will, that that would transpire. God has his determined will in the scripture that that had to transpire because there was no other way. There was no other remedy to redeem sinful man. <clears throat> and so God provided this for us. What a wonderful thing. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we see that <clears throat> Jesus himself said he laid down his life. No one took it from him. He laid it down only to pick it up again. Because of his love for you and me. So that was God's determined will, was the cross. And you say, well, why did it have to be so bruised and bloody and, and, and actually <coughs> harmful and tragic? All those things were in it. How could that happen to uh, God himself? Do you know that <clears throat> the only uh, religion uh, in the world today is for man trying to reach up to God, trying to do things to, to make God appeased with them. But Christianity is far different. Our God reached down to man. Our God came to us. You see, it's the only religion, if you want to call it religion, where our God died for us in the song we said. Amazing grace. We just sang that, didn't we? If you heard the words that our God would die for me. Hallelujah. What, what a wonderful thing. So what does all that mean practically? Let's, let's talk about this for a couple minutes. If God determined that so that he can reconcile sinful man with a holy God through the cross. 
And the question was personal in the song we sang. Are you washed in the blood? There was a church board that was interviewing uh, individuals for uh, to become church members. And uh, one lady was being interviewed, and one of the individuals on the board paused for a minute, and he said, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And she said, well, I really never thought of it that way. You see, it is a personal. We, we, we hear about the cross, and it has like some surface thing that it's for someone else. Or even we understand it to some level. But do you understand the substitutionary? That that cross was for me. You see, that's really where I should be. But Christ took it for me. Not just for the whole world, but for me personally. That's how it was applied to me. In the church of Corinth, where <clears throat> Paul writes these words, uh, to the church where uh, they're coming to a place where they were having confusion in the church. They uh, started moving away from uh, the, the, the basics of Christianity that Christ died on the cross for our sins and then rose again. Uh, they started to become uh, with the vision. They started following different leaders uh, and Paul addressed it like this when they uh, declared to them. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm just going to read verse 17 and 18 down through uh, a few other verses also. So I hope you're following. It says this, For Christ did not send me, this is Paul speaking, <clears throat> to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made to no effect. He was saying, if I come to you with just persuasive words and with elegance and those things, the cross would be to no effect. And then verse 18 says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise and where is the scribe? Where is the spirit of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message <coughs> preached to save those who believe. And now he talks about the two. The Jews requested a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. That's a stumbling block to the Jews. And to the Greeks it was foolishness. May God add his blessing to his holy word. Father, I pray, Lord, for insight right now. Pray, Father, if there's someone here this morning, for all of us to get a, a grasp on what you're declaring to us here. Give us a greater understanding. We'll thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The Bible says that the power of sin is death. And if we've all fallen short of God's glory, then the wages of our sin was death. We all were going to die eternally separate from God, all of us. But God provided a way for sinful humanity, for me, so that I could cross over from death to life, from darkness into light, into God's holy presence. You think about the world, who needs the cross? Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and it's whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We think sometimes a message like that, brutal, the cross of Christ, is for those maybe who are incarcerated, or maybe for the individual living under the bridge over there. Uh, but we're refined, and we really don't need 
the cross. How many know we can't get to heaven without the cross? I've watched the transformation of many individuals and from their lives that were in darkness were brought in to light because they embraced the cross, the power of God into salvation. We as a church cannot stop preaching the cross. Paul writes in Romans 1.16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation for those who believe. This is the sending point of that gospel because everything else, yeah, now there's good things in scriptures where for edifying and building up and through prayer. And, but if we miss the cross, all those other things will be just null and void. Matter of fact, if you're sitting here, when you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and came through that cross and believed that he died on it for you, you're going to feel guilt and you're going to feel shame. And the reason I say that, when there's conviction on our lives at times, that that comes from the Holy Spirit. We're kind of learning that on Sunday evening. When conviction comes in our life, the Holy Spirit, but there's grace in that conviction, there's always the remedy. But if there's guilt and shame, and you just say, preacher, stop it, I don't want to hear that anymore, examine yourself. Because you're probably on the wrong side of the cross. You remember the two thieves? One was on the right side, and one was on the left. He knew that he needed to save it. I think the problem is that the cross takes the proud Adam, Adam and puts him to death. And what that means is, have you ever gone through life and said, well, I don't need help. No, I, I, no come on. Yeah, I don't, we can't receive it. Yeah. I don't need help. I got it. I got this. Well, if you think you've got it, then we're in trouble. Because we're need, we need a savior. You see, and if if you don't understand that, then we're on the wrong side. It is the power of God and the salvation. Uh, remember, years ago, I was reading about uh, Angola prison. Any ever heard of Angola? In the late nineties. Bureau Kane became the <clears throat> warden, and uh, Angola prison was one of the worst prisons. There was, it, you wouldn't survive in there. And 99% uh, of the people were there on life sentence. Bureau Kane, which was a Christian, became in the light, late 90s, and uh, he resided over a death penalty uh, of one of the inmates, and he went to talk to him, <clears throat> and the individual cursed God, cursed the warden, cursed the judge. He just went off into his uh, death. And uh, he shared that with his mother, which was a kid, uh, Christian too. And his mother said, you have to do something. You have to do something there. There are men going off into eternity not knowing Christ. <clears throat> so what he did, he started to build chapels there. Now, long and short, today Angola has more Christians in that prison than any other place. They have a seminary in there through the Baptist press. They're raising up leaders to preach, not that they'll ever get out, but to preach in other prisons. Angola prison was transformed by the power of God through the cross of Jesus. Now you say, well, I've heard of those jailhouse conversions, you know, they just want to say that they're Christ Christians so that the parole board will be easier on. These people aren't getting them. They're not getting them. But they applied the cross of 
Christ to their life because now they're a new creation. <coughs> they went from death to life, eternal life. You can read up on the Angola prison. It's a, it's a wonderful story. Matter of fact, they even uh, make caskets there. And the reason they make caskets there is prior to Bureau King coming there, they would bury their dead in uh, cardboard boxes. And I remember reading about when they were having one funeral procession that was raining and the guy fell through. Kind of sad. Funny but sad, right? But they made caskets there, and they have made caskets for the last uh, um, few presidents. Billy Graham's casket was, was made there. Um, it's some powerful stories they have uh, coming out of that prison. But what I'm getting at is that it's a changed individual. Now, that's all well and good, Pastor Bob, those stories, but now have we been changed? Have we been transformed? You know, I'm not saying live in a perfect life because we're far from it, amen? We, we fall short. But there should have been some change in our lives. We must have a desire for holy things. Reading the Bible, prayer, going to church prayer me these things are all the effects of being born again you see now <clears throat> they're not the only things church doesn't save you does it the cross of christ saves you <clears throat> but if we have no desire for those things i would say just go ahead and examine yourself this is not a a message to condemn anyone. God loves you so much, He doesn't want you going off into eternity and never applying that cross to yourself. Because that woman, from that interview, was on the wrong side. I never thought of it that way. I know about the cross. I knew Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, but I didn't know that He died for my sins. You mean, I need. A savior we all need a savior you see and if you haven't applied it you see there's a turnstile and you can't go in on someone else's coattails <laughs> you know i once heard that you know god doesn't have a grandchildren <laughs> i can't bring in my own grandkids that i love so much we have to apply that cross ourselves okay so but and I know I spent enough time on that, but why? It was substitutionary. That cross that bore our sins, that Jesus died on, that took away the penalty of our sins because the wages was death for all of us. Therefore, something was paid for me. Jesus paid it. But not only did he pay for my sins and took away the penalty, the cross takes away the power of sin over our lives so that we can live an upright and godly life. Not perfect, but we're able to overcome. We can be more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. See? And that may be on a daily basis to apply that. Something, again, we, we learned on our Sunday night that I've heard before, not me, but him. I can't, but he can. I can't, but he can. Right? So we, it was God's plan of redemption. There was no other way. The world looks at that as foolishness, friends. But God has taken his wisdom and made foolishness out of man. Today, the world has a different way of looking at things. <clears throat> their transition into something else is with hormone blockers. Now, I, I know I just had to throw that in there but to be funny for a second. The world's wisdom of moving to transformation, okay, is foolishness. Very ridiculous. But in their eyes, they think it's right. It's the paradox of this here that we see in scripture, right? It's a paradox. 
So when you try to uh, tell someone that you have a Savior that died on the cross for your sins, if they're not saved and they don't, it seems foolish to them is what the scripture says. It just be, seems like it's absurd. That's why you don't have them busting down the doors. <laughs> you see? But Paul says, I preach Christ crucified. He said, I didn't come. If you look at chapter 2, look what he says there in chapter 2. It says uh, in the first verse, And I, brother, I came to you. I didn't come with elegance of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith should not rest on me, but on God. Do you see what he's saying there? So when I preach from talking about the cross of Christ, th this is God's only avenue for salvation. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father except by me. There's no other avenue. And, if, and if, see, do you know in scriptures like in, in Galatians 1, it says, if you preach any other gospel, let you be cursed. You see? So what is preaching another gospel? Soft spoken? Maybe persuasive words in another way? Come to Weekstown Community Church, and we're going to help you to be a better person. We're going to help you not to have anger issues. We're going to show you what it is uh, to live in this world a better individual. <clears throat> That's not the message. The message is receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, all those things are effects from the cross, but that's not the avenue that we preach. Because if we preach anything other than that, we add it or subtract it to the salvation message. Mm -hmm. That's why I believe in the days that we're facing. Now, if you studied your Bible and you understand that we're in a place where the church is going to be a, an apostate, you know what that means? A falling away in the church. The only way to hold us together is to remember we preach Christ crucified. He died on the cross for our sins. And guess what? He rose again. Now he sits at the right hand of God the Father interceding for us. We have an advocate. We have one we can call him. He says, I write these things to you, dear brother, so that you do not sin. But if you do sin, we have one who stands in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You know, the time just goes by quick. But I think about um, where we're going in a society. Anyone with spiritual common sense can see that we're heading the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you see... <clears throat> and now... This is not to, uh, to pinpoint on someone, but to understand why we're, where we're at. Look at the second chapter, 1 Corinthians, for a minute, and look at verse uh, 13 and 14 for a minute with me. Look what it says. And then let me give you verse 12 through 14. And it says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us, thus not by God. 
We have a discernment that God has given to us if you've been born again. Do you know what being born again? We receive the spirit of God that dwells within us. It's not my spirit, it's his spirit that lives within me. And he gives me discernment. Okay? Verse 13 says this. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teach, but with the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now look at verse 14. But the natural man, a man unregenerated, a man that didn't come through the cross, a man that doesn't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Listen to what it says. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Essentially saying the man without the Spirit cannot understand the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. They are foolishness to them. So my preaching right now, the things I am speaking, if you're unregenerated, is foolishness to you. That's what the Bible says. And you're sitting there saying, wait, what is that preacher talking about? Here's the good news, and I always have to bring a remedy. Let today be the day of your salvation. Let today be the day. Say, Lord, you know, maybe I've been on the wrong side of the cross. Maybe I haven't understood that you died for me, that I, that I needed a Savior. I knew that you came to save the world. Maybe the individuals there at Angola Prison or, or the, the individuals that live under the bridge. No. Christ came for us to save us from our sin and to give us a new life that we can live for him. To set us free from that bondage that holds humanity. To give you new life. And if you haven't received that new life. Let today be the day of our salvation. That we go forward. Understanding the message of the cross. Because it is the power of God. For those who believe. It takes us from death to life. Eternal life. Now I say all that. Because God loves you. And God doesn't want you to fool yourself. Just because I've been in church 30 years, 40 years, many of them, that's a scary book. Jesus said this to you. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Why did he say that? Because many just went through the ritual and the road. And preacher, we don't like when you share like this because I'm telling you, God will hold me accountable if I don't declare that truth. Could you imagine? I could imagine. My son died for all humanity, and you didn't tell me <clears throat> that they need the Savior individually. That is such great love for us. God doesn't want you to feel bad. God wants to heal you. Mm -hmm. Now, it, you may be going through a time in your life where uh, conviction has been bearing down on you, but the reason that is is because God wants to extend, extend grace into your life. He wants to bless you. He knows you. But he wants you to know him more. Because that's where real life is. Amen. <clears throat> I'll stop. And uh, I hope you receive that. And uh, as a church, I think we need the foundation of this truth. Uh, preach. And that's what uh, Paul said there in chapter 1 again if you go back um, he said that there is no other foundation that has been laid except for the Lord Jesus that's where we go Christ crucified 
Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for each one here, oh God. Your cross was great love for humanity. The Jews, they demanded signs from heaven. But yet, Jesus, you stood right before them, and they missed you. The Greeks, they wanted wisdom. They wanted stock of philosophies and Epicurean uh, things of this world. But yet, Lord, you have sent to us a way to salvation that the world can't accept. Mm -hmm. But Lord, we understand, Lord, it is the power of God unto salvation. I received that cross for myself. I believe you died on that cross for my sin. And I believe that you validated it by being raised again. You sealed me for the day of redemption. And I pray if there's someone here who has not let today be that day. Bless each one here, God. You only tell them this because you love them. And you want them part of the family. Embrace them today with your peace, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for giving us a ear to hear and a heart to receive what you're saying. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>